maybe you can start by just telling me what a grant like this buys. What what does five hundred thousand hmm. dollars do for you? It sounds like a like a good chunk of change. Yeah, um, the Native Fish Conservation Program in Yellowstone Park, you know, is uh, is largely supported by gifts like this. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it, there's a million dollars per year. Um, of donated funds like this that support the program um, annually, and those dollars are matched by Park Service monies that we have, um, and that's really what drives the whole overall effort. So, but so so what what can you do? Uh, getting so you get five hundred thousand dollars, it's matched by another five hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So a million dollars, what does that allow you to do? Right. Well, uh, a large part of our work up here is is the major you know effort we have on Yellowstone Lake to restore the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem and um, where our native Yellowstone cutthroat trout uh, persisted for thousands of years uh, they were the sole trout of the lake and they supported a, a food web there a natural food web that includes things like ospreys and bald eagles and grizzly bears river otters and these kinds of things that people love to come and see in this park so um, this effort is more than just a fisheries restoration effort, it's actually an ecosystem restoration effort, and that's what this money is buying. Um, a part of this that we're doing is suppression of a non-native species that was introduced to the lake, lake trout, which are not native to Yellowstone Park, and they're large predatory fish that uh, prey upon the native cutthroat trout and um, cause a steep decline in the native cutthroat trout. Um, and so we're reversing that, that actions or that, that uh, you know, the impact of the lake trout on the cutthroat trout. And it's pretty costly, so. It, yeah, how do you do that? How do you yeah. that? So we have a large netting program, a gill netting program that's targeting these invasive non-native lake trout. And we net the lake trout from when ice comes off first in the spring, usually in late May, all the way through towards the end of October. We have a large netting program with multiple uh, commercial size boats and crews that are targeting these non-native lake trout and removing them from Yellowstone Lake. And how successful is that? Does that, does that really work? Because it seems like there would always be some that get away and then they just come back sure. again. Yeah, the lake trout with the technologies we have right now will always uh, persist in Yellowstone Lake. We don't have a way to completely remove them. But what we can do and what we are doing is annually netting them and suppressing the population which then allows the native cutthroat trout to rebound and return to their uh, important ecological role in the ecosystem. Okay, and you're, uh, you talked about the gill netting. Uh, are you doing anything else? Is there mm -hmm. any other technology that works? Yeah, you know gill netting is still the best method to suppress these non-native lake trout, but we are really working hard to develop alternative methods that will hopefully be more efficient over the long term to, to keep the lake trout population low and suppressed. Um, these methods are, are focused on the lake trout spawning sites that we know of in the lake. The lake trout spawn in the fall of the year and we're developing methods that kill the eggs on these spawning sites which are really focused you know, limited areas that we can probably, we believe, do uh, be really effective at suppressing the population. And how do you do that? Yeah, uh, the, the method that's proven so far to be the most effective to kill lake trout eggs on spawning sites is actually just taking the dead lake trout themselves from the netting program and putting them on top of the spawning sites after the lake trout spawn. And, the decomposition of that, uh, those carcasses, uh, causes a loss of the dissolved oxygen in the water, and then it kills the lake trout eggs just within a few days. So we're moving forward pretty quickly on further refinement of that method, and we'll hopefully uh, be implementing it at a larger scale as the years go on here. That, that's a pretty cool system. <laughs> so it doesn't involve any chemicals or right. anything like that. Right, so the methods that we're, that we're working on really hard right now to kill lake trout eggs on these spawning sites don't involve bringing any foreign material into the lake at all, at least right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, we, we talked a moment ago about how you're never really going to get get complete eradication. So yeah. is one part of this program or another, either the gill netting or the, the spawning beds or both, going mm -hmm. to have to go on indefinitely? Yeah, um, for sure. You know, if any of these methods to suppress the lake trout were, were discontinued, um, the population would rebound and once again take over the lake and harm the cutthroat trout, you know. Uh, it, 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 that that uh, threat is always going to be there, mm -hmm. and so this is a program that will need to be maintained long term at to some level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we were talking about how when I fished the lake back in the late '90s, how it was so much different than when I came mm -hmm. back in about 2006 to fish it again. Sure. What's it like now? How far back have you gotten? Yeah, you know the numbers now of the cutthroat trout in Yellowstone Lake are not yet what they were, you know, in the 1990s, prior to the impact of the lake trout. But they are rebounding, and the population is, uh, you know, there are, there are an abundance of extremely large cutthroat trout now in Yellowstone Lake. The fishing is actually really, really good, and I would encourage people to come up and experience it. Mm. Yeah. Hey, can mm. you give us a little history? So how did we get lake trout in, yeah. in Yellowstone Lake? You know, we're not sure how lake trout got introduced to Yellowstone Lake. Um, they were intentionally introduced to Yellowstone National Park in another lake in the upper Snake River system. And these lakes are called Lewis and Shoshone Lakes. Um, the U.S. Fish Commission stocked those lakes with lake trout um, in 1890. So lake trout have been in Yellowstone National Park for a long, long time. Um, but they were not found in Yellowstone Lake until 1994. And we, even now, we still do not know how they got introduced to the lake. Oh, is, it, is there a migration path that they can follow? <laughs> no, there's no natural connection between uh, lakes in the upper Snake River system um, to Yellowstone Lake directly. There is a natural connection between the Snake River system and the upper Yellowstone River system south of the park, it's a place called Two Ocean Pass. And there is a chance that the lake trout actually accessed Yellowstone Lake over time by swimming up and over Two Ocean Pass. That's just a hypothesis yeah. that, 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 you know, it's just educated guess, I guess hmm. you'd say. <laughs> so do you know why back in 1890 the, hmm. the fish were introduced into uh, sure. Lewis and Shoshone? Yeah. Well, just soon after the park was created in 1872, you know, it was recognized a large portion of the park was actually naturally fishless. Um, and it was because a lot of the waters are above barriers to fish movement, waterfalls and things like that, that fish, once the glaciers receded, fish didn't have access to these upper headwater areas due to the waterfalls. And so nearly half the park actually had no fish. The waters of the park actually had no fish. So, um, and at that time, um, the U.S. Fish Commission was established at that same time, and they recognized opportunities to introduce fish fishes to these waters that didn't have any. So that's what happened then, beginning in 1889 and 1890, and then moving on up through the early 1900s. Um, a lot of fish were stocked from outside Yellowstone that were brought in. And some of the first ones were these non-native lake trout, hmm. yeah. And it wasn't just lake trout. Either. No, right. Yeah, so at the time, the ecological impacts of introducing non-native fish just weren't understood, weren't known. It was more about providing fish as food for people who lived here or the visitors that came here and providing sport angling opportunities. That was the focus back then, you know, but over uh, the 1900s, the realization came about what the impacts of those non-native introductions were on our native species and on the ecology of the park. Mm -hmm. And so all that stopped, you know, by about the mid-1900s for sure. No more non-native fish were introduced and the focus then started to become, and of course now is totally um, maintaining our native species and the ecological systems that they support, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and creeks are a problem too, not from lake yeah. trout, but from mm -hmm. other species. Yeah, so 
there are large parts of Yellowstone that were naturally uh, uh, supported native cutthroat trout and Arctic grayling as well, or native to Yellowstone Park and mountain whitefish. Those are our, I guess you'd say native fish, sport, sport fishes. Um, but when brook trout or rainbow trout, brown trout were introduced into these same areas, um, we then saw either a loss or total extirpation uh, of the native fish. So we are pretty actively now trying to reverse a lot of what went on, what went on over the last you know, century or so, and bringing back our native fish to a lot of these creeks and rivers and streams and so on, where they once were. It's a and, big part of our program. And that's, a, that's pretty much a, a poison using the rhododendron, oh. and then you install a weir afterward? You know, there's different approaches to uh, sort of preserving and restoring native fish in, in, in rivers and streams outside of Yellowstone Lake. Um, there are some places like in the Lamar River drainage where we have abundance of native cutthroat trout, but they are being threatened by, in this case, non-native rainbow trout. Um, so in those kind of situations, we'll electrofish or we also ask anglers to remove the non-native rainbow trout when they catch them. So it's a selective removal of the non-natives to preserve the cutthroat that remain there. That's one approach. Another approach is where if we have situations where the cutthroat or the grayling, for example, are totally gone, we'll then go in and use rotenone, uh, a piscicide, it's a fish toxin, to remove the non-native fish from that stream. Um, we'll have it protected from downstream uh, invasion going into the future by either a waterfall or uh, a barrier that we would put in place. And then that creates for us a headwater refuge for natives, which we then reintroduce to that headwater area. So we're doing a lot of that, both uh, in the Madison and Gallatin watersheds, Mm. especially. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned asking uh, anglers to keep the non-native fish, yep. and I know that you've done that with the lake trout yep. um, up on, uh, on Yellowstone Lake. How's that being accepted? Is that working? Oh, yeah. That? You know, um, it's, it's been fine. Um, it was a change, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> when we first proposed these kinds of changes to the regulations. But we are monitoring the fishery uh, and the angling success of these waters where, for example, we're, we have a must-kill regulation for rainbow trout, and again, in some places, to protect our cutthroat. And the quality of the angling has not changed. Um, the fish caught per hour, the sizes of the fish caught have not changed. They still remain really, really good. And, but at the same time, we're protecting our native cutthroat trout, which is the number one goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, the the fishermen support that. I mean, they, they kind of understand the science. Yeah, I think I think that uh, a lot of folks uh, are pretty passionate about the fisheries of Yellowstone, the people that come here, and um, they're really supportive overall of our of our conservation goals, and uh, and and will do what they can to you know to help us with that. Hmm. It's been really good. It's a big part of our overall effort involving anglers into our conservation. And on those streams, um, is that going to be sort of like the lake effort? That's something that's never really going to go away. You're going to mm. have to keep doing that forever. So if you're talking about um, on streams where we're just doing selective removal, either by electrofishing or angling to remove the non-native fish, th those kind of efforts will need to continue long term, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, you know those non-natives are always going to be there to, to some level, and uh, but in places where we're doing complete restorations and creating headwater refuges, that kind of stuff, um, no. Once we go in and, and reintroduce the native fish, um, we can pretty much walk away, aside from the monitoring long term. But uh, that do, that type of approach does not take uh, repetitive right. action. 
Yeah, I, I, what was it, five, six years ago, Grayling Creek was mm-hmm. a project to do something like that. Sure. So uh, if you have an angler who's interested, you know, in just going after native fish, do you yeah. make those areas where you've done that known to them? Um, well, you know, yes. You know, so all of our restoration efforts are pretty well publicized and we have annual reports and these kinds of things that people can turn to uh, or they can just contact us up here and ask. But we are really greatly increasing opportunities for anglers that are seeking native species in this region, for sure. Yep. <laughs> so, and so it sounds like you feel pretty good about, about yeah. all these projects and efforts. They're working out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they really have been. Um, we've really increased the, the total miles of streams and the acres of lakes that, that, that have our native species. and. Um, you know, these things now can be here for the long-term future of the park. It's pretty awesome. Cool. <laughs> that truck did a nice move right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Wasn't that great>? <laughs> 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 You know, any thoughts on the... I mean, I, well, I guess one thing I did want to get to um, was, uh, you know, because these efforts are going to go on basically forever, um, the, are you challenged or do you find it daunting to always having to be looking for money to fund this? Mm. Yeah. So I guess I would say that um, our Native Fish Conservation Program had it when it orig- was originated in 2010 you know it had a 20 year vision um, so we're kind of right in the middle of that now. Um, the work to control Lake Trout and Yellowstone Lake is always going to have to continue at some level, but w- what we're working really hard at now is crashing that population so that long-term maintenance will cost much, much less. Regarding the backcountry stream restoration work, you know, we have uh, benchmarks that we're seeking to achieve, and once we meet those, then even that effort can be far reduced long-term. Mm-hmm. So. When you uh, when you're able to isolate a backcountry creek and, mm-hmm. and restore the headwaters, for instance, yeah, does that help downstream at all? Oh yeah, um, oh, it'll help in terms of uh, fish that stray out of that upper headwater restoration area, then are caught by anglers downstream, which is pretty, which is pretty cool, you know. So we've seen that already quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's kind of like a protected breeding ground True. for the entire. Creek. Yeah, to some degree. Yeah, so it diversifies the downstream fishery to some extent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you bet, man. All right. <laughs>